this is Bob Scully, and welcome to another edition of The World Show, Entrepreneurs, The Red Line Series. And happy birthday to all our Greek friends and friends of Greek origin across North America. March 25th is coming up, isn't it? And that is your national day, the national birthday of Greece. And uh, long may it live. It has been there a long time and has given the world so much in terms of institutions, traditions, laws, philosophy, and food. And it's not every day, entrepreneurs are always brave people, but it's not every day that an entrepreneur is also a war hero. That was the case with John Moskalaidis, who was a World War II hero in the Greek resistance, who walked half his country on foot to go back home after the war, then got on a boat, and a man who obviously feared nothing started a company the minute he got to America. That company would eventually grow to be the largest supplier, importer, and maker of Greek specialty foods in North America, Krinos. And you're going to meet his son-in-law, a worthy successor, an entrepreneur in his own right, but a very elegant man who can talk about Greece, its present situation, and the wonderful qualities of Greek yogurt. Here is Alexander Georgiadis. Alexander Georgiadis, uh, Kalimera. Kalimera. I am holding what's going to be one of our topics today, magical Greek yogurt. Everybody's talking about Greek yogurt, but um, let's, let's do this chronologically a little bit. Let's go back to Greece uh, around 1950 after the war um, when, uh, when uh, your father-in-law was a war hero. Let's talk about that. Well, coming out of World War II, Greece had the Civil War, so he spent about four years up in the mountains fighting, he was in the elite force, came back home on foot, mm. all the way from the north of Greece to wow. the south of Greece, uh, came back home and then his elder brother, these were the guys that were making the decisions back then, his father had died many years ago, told him that he should take off and go to the United States. That was the big new market. They had their olives, their olive groves. And they needed a market. <laughs> so, In Amphisa, near Delphi. In, in Amphisa, near Delphi. So I guess the oracles had yeah, something right. to do with that. <laughs> and they picked the right market. So he left for the United States and brought a ship. Landed in New York without speaking a word of English waiting for the olives to arrive. They didn't travel <laughs> with him. <laughs> so no, obviously not. He set up a little company, and at the same time, which was called Arista Olive Company back then, and at the same time, he enrolled gradually. He started speaking and learning English, and he enrolled to New York University to uh, finish uh, school, and he finished business school there. With his classmates and some of his fellow war uh, mates that were, yes. they were fighting together, uh, these were the first people that he hired, and they stayed with the company for many, many years. Oh, really? Wow. And they set up this little company, and they received the olives. They started selling olives to the little stores. There were a lot of Greek immigrants back then. And gradually they said, okay, you know, the olives are doing fine, so why don't we bring some olive oil as well? So the brother arranged and he shipped some olive oil as well. Oh, yeah, he's back and home. At he's the, back home yeah. <laughs> organizing all yeah, this. Yeah, of course. And then with the olive oil came, you know, additional products like tomato paste and peppers and uh, all sorts of, you know, products that the Greek immigrants were looking for. They had left, you know, some yeah, of course, didn't yeah. even speak English yet. They would go to small stores to buy the products that they loved and cherished, and they were all homesick. Yeah, of course. They came yeah. to find some work. Cheese came along and the feta, feta cheese, yeah. which of course was back then only consumed by the Greek immigrants. No, that's Nobody true. Nowadays, we, don't, we have trouble understanding that. It was very, very specialized. <laughs> very product. specialized product. So uh, the, the olive oil was probably the biggest success. And back then, the brand that this company was packing in Greece, the name was Krinos. Which means? Which is a flower. Ah. 
I think it's a lily, right? A lily for I'm, I'm cheating. You told flower. me before, so that's why I <laughs> seem to know. <laughs> it symbolizes the purity. Yeah. This became a big success. So all the little store owners would wait for the olive oil to arrive. And as John's little truck was delivering, making the deliveries, they would come out and they say, Krinos has arrived. Krinos has arrived. Mm. Which was referring to the olive oil. Yeah. So by 70s, in the, in the 70s, there was no point in having Arista Olive Company. In the first, it's still the company changed name and everybody knew it as Crinos anyway. Yeah. So it switched to Crinos. And you became, the Crinos, I mean, became the biggest importer. It was ahead of its time in a way because now Greek food is very fashionable. But in those days, it was a specialty uh, line of products. Um, but you became the biggest in North America, I think. The biggest in North America, and of course we catered and, uh, at first exclusively the immigrants, the Greek immigrants. But things started growing. Let's not forget one of the biggest uh, jobs that uh, the Greek immigrants would do after they settled was make restaurants. Yes, of course. So Greek food no, of was Of course, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the you, first yeah. Uh, the way that the North Americans were introduced to Greek food. And so Greeks even had, easy. I've even caught some Greeks running Chinese restaurants. I mean, the, the oh, Greeks yes. were very good. <laughs> very good at running yeah. restaurants. Yeah, it was really, it's really a whole culture. Um, and one interesting thing is, uh, um, in those days, Astoria, Steinway, Long, uh, Long, Island, Long Island City, um, uh, in Detroit too, there was a- uh, Chicago. Th Chicago, very thriving Greek community. But also on this side of the border, Montreal, Toronto, and even more recently, in a way, I think the immigration came a little bit later. So your uh, father-in-law, Mr. Moskalaidis, John uh, Moskalaidis, Moskalaidis, yes. um, had the vision, a little bit like Rothschild in the 18th century, on a smaller scale, um, to more. send his to send his family in different directions, just as he had been sent. So, so your branch, you married his daughter. Mm -hmm. Your branch came up here. It's in Canada. Well, he had come up here before that. Uh, we started in uh, the Canadian business in 1965 as Arista back then. Mm -hmm. Then in the 70s again, it was renamed to Crinos Foods. It started off in Montreal, a very small operation, a very small warehouse out in Montreal. Later on, the business was doing very well. There were quite a few uh, Greek immigrants that had landed in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. um, Later on, we opened uh, in the late 70s. We, the company had uh, a big warehouse in Toronto. So we were serving these two big communities, the community in Montreal and in Toronto through Greenos Foods Canada. Basically, back then, they were, they shared, they had the same products. Whatever you had in the US, you had in Canada. Mm -hmm. But there were, of course, some differences but nothing as visible because it was, again, exclusively for the Greek immigrants. As things changed and now we've reached to the Canadian consumer and Greenos Foods uh, in the U.S. is reaching the American consumer, things are starting to change. They are starting to diversify. We have different products here or we market the products differently here than we do in the U.S. I'm handling the Canadian operation. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know there was a difference in the consumers uh, for, for oh, yes. Mediterranean items. Oh yes, I think the Canadian consumer is uh, a lot more European compared to the American consumer. The American consumer is very price conscious. Here, there, the Canadian consumer is also very quality conscious, or a lot more quality conscious. Nice. Willing to pay a bit more. Of course, you've seen the big trends start from the US yeah Greek yogurt we talked before that's right we're gonna that. talk about it again yes <laughs> of course um, but but um, it's interesting to I'm sure it must have been even more interesting to you it's interesting to me how it broke out of the specialty market the public taste went to Mediterranean diets and so on were you surprised by that because I think it exploded at some point it did I think it exploded in two phases you know the first explosion was when through the restaurants uh, that people were getting accustomed to even the Greeks we talked before they can have steakhouses they can have Chinese restaurants yeah. the Greek <laughs> salad is there 
Not true, eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no matter what. You can give what. it a Chinese name. <laughs> <laughs> you can give it a Chinese name, but the Greek salad is there. Feta cheese is there. Olive is there. And they do appreciate their olive oil mm -hmm. to be good quality. And they sure. do try yeah. to get the best. So uh, there was a big initial expansion. I think back then we tried extremely hard to build on the Mediterranean diet uh, concept. It was quite hard. Uh, it's not that easy. First no. of all, Mediterranean, it's, it's a big area. It's not exclusive to Greece, mm -hmm. Italy, uh, France, Spain. Spain. Mm -hmm. They all claim the Mediterranean diet. So there was, we didn't really have such a huge comparative advantage towards the big Italian importers or the big French importers. Probably the turning point where the Greek products really saw uh, the second boom was the uh, Greek yogurt presence in the United States. Really? Oh, Suddenly see. this exploded out of proportion. The Greek yogurt was the number one item. The market was growing like crazy. People's you know, companies started saying, what's going on here? It changed completely the, uh, the yogurt category. It and is. that's because we, we have to talk about it because it's very fashionable. Everybody demands Greek yogurt and then on menus they put it down. What's so different about it? I would say everybody's stressing that it's healthy and it is. It has all the protein and very low fat or zero fat. There are many products, in my opinion, that can qualify in this category. It tastes good. Hmm. It really tastes good. They whip it differently. There's something, there's something to the... They the, strain it. Uh, to make the proper Greek yogurt, you have to strain the water out of the milk and make it thick. Now, there are two schools of thought on that. There's one school that says we make the Greek yogurt by uh, adding solids, so that will make it thicker. Mm -hmm. And then there's a school of thought where you simply strain the water out. We've chosen the second path. Which is more traditional. It's, it is the only traditional. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, more expensive, but the quality is a lot better. And this has, uh, as you say, it created an explosion. Did you, were you able to move into, I guess it works through retailers, you sort of were able to go to the D'Agostinos of the world and, and A&P and so on and say, we want shelf space. It's all about, I'm told anyway, in this business, shelf space is very important and it, it comes at a premium. Everybody's fighting for every square inch. Did that happen at some point? It's happening now. Uh. We're still at the beginning, our first baby steps here in Canada with the Greek yogurt. Um, it's very tough. It's very hard because the, the giants are in. Mm -hmm, yeah. The really big companies with the huge marketing budgets, with you know, spending millions of dollars, and of course the supermarkets are asking for very high listing fees. So how does a small, medium-sized company that has an excellent product. Mm -hmm. How does it fit and how does it fight this war, which is a tough one to start with? I mean, we don't have the marketing budget the other guys have. We don't have the muscle that the other companies have. So basically the strategy is we create a very desirable package Mm -hmm. We adjust it to the Canadian taste, and above all, we come out with the best quality. All natural, no preservatives, no milk ingredients. Um, it's all as natural as it can get. It may cost a little more. I know we're probably not going to get 60-70% of the market. That's not our goal, but we want our share as the premium Greek yogurt, the real Greek yogurt in the Canadian market. And do you have to have loss leaders and freebies and, you know, maybe supply a grocery chain for a few weeks before for free so that, you know, a loss leader, the old tactic, does that work? Yes, of course we're going to have that. But that's, you know, the second stage. We're still now in the initial where we have, uh, we have some listings, 
it's very difficult for us as well. Don't forget it's a company that has been distributing so far long life products. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a big change for this, us yeah, now, this, this, short life product. That's right, very yeah. different. You have to keep replenishing. We have to keep. The, the whole plan was from the beginning and the, because it was in our mind and we, we have to establish ourselves in Canada. Who do we want to be? We want to be the number one company in Canada dealing with Greek products. So the first thing you have to do is establish yourself as the number one in feta cheese. Yeah, right. That's yeah. what when, defines. Let's not forget, yeah, of course. That's, yeah. that's what defines the Greek, salad, yeah. the Greek products. Yes, you know, you're the right. The salad. You know, Greek salad, feta cheese. But not feta from, in, in, in Greece, as I recall, because I used to have pizza. It was really great. In Athens, they would serve you pizza made with feta. They told me it was from the sheep, the yes. real feta. Yes, yes. Here it's not, right? It's from... No, that's not. That's where we made a big change in Canada. We have our dairy plant... It's, we had an excellent uh, synergy with a dairy plant in Canada, and we are an affiliate company of ours. We built a state-of-the-art dairy, and we make feta cheese in Canada from 100% sheep, 100% oh, goat. From the ewe. Cow and goat. Really? Or cow. We have seven or eight different kinds of feta cheese. Oh, really? And it's surprising how different it is. You know, the, the people in the, the West, in Vancouver, would go for goat more than <laughs> <laughs> the, the people in the uh, And Toronto. how about in America, same thing? America is different. America is a very different market. Uh, there is a lot of domestic fat, and that would be the, probably the bulk of it. But it's all cow. I mean, ah, it's cow. Not, yeah, that's uh, it. And so your best sellers, uh, feta, open the door, and yogurt will be the the cash cow. No pun that intended. That was the idea. We come in. Uh, if we manage to make a real impact in feta cheese, then automatically, when we come out with a Greek yogurt, because it's Greek, yeah. <laughs> people are going to well. And Krinos, also Krinos, they know your brand. Krinos, they know our brand now, and they know we specialize in anything that has to do with Greece and Greek products. So rightfully so, we would probably be the people that know best how to make the real Greek yogurt. And I was curious when I was reading the research if the terrible economic uh, crisis in Greece would come up, and it does come up. You mentioned uh, to to our research people that. Your suppliers, some of them went bankrupt. Uh, there was. Let's talk about that. When did you ever did you ever think Greece would get hit with that kind of tsunami, the way it did, economic tsunami? Uh, I think that something was definitely coming, but not to that magnitude. And uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the deficit, Greece, you know that. I, I think one when thinks about Greece, we have to realize. We're talking about six years of recession, mm. over 27% of unemployment, yeah. and what's even worse, close to 60% unemployment for the young people. Mm -hmm. So it's not a financial issue we're facing with. Surely there's a financial dimension to it. We have a social problem, and that's what the people in Europe really have to think about first. In our business, apart from uh, how sad things are when one is walking around Athens, especially in the big cities, with our suppliers, yes, we've had problems. There's no financing. Hmm. We have to finance sometimes, you know, to help them out so they are able to export. And it's not that they don't have olives. The olives are there. It's they don't have the material where to pack the olives in, yeah, uh, which yeah. is basically imported. So the whole chain of the whole supply. chain. That is where we have to move in. We've seen quite a few of uh, suppliers that are going through very hard periods, and some that are gone. And they're not the small, uh, just the small businesses. We have big businesses now that are in deep trouble, and something has to be done. It's a very sad situation. Do you see it coming back now, or is it too early yet? Uh, no, I think it's too early, even though the politicians like to paint a very nice uh, picture. I think mm -hmm. it's too early. But 
I always prefer to see, you know, the cup half full and trying to see the positive side. There are a lot of positives uh, to this sad story. Because of the unemployment, especially with the young people, a lot have moved from the cities. They've gone to the countryside. Mm -hmm. They've gone back and they're dealing with farming. Yes, I've read that, yeah. They're dealing with, you know, the, the old image of the shepherd, you know, has changed. Now they're doing it the right way. So you have these young, educated, ambitious, and talented people that have gone back to the villages and are coming up with a much better product. There is future in that, and that's very good for uh, all of us and especially for the country. There's a balance. You cannot have a country where 60 to 70 percent of the population of a country is in one city. No, of course. Yeah. And basically half of them are public servants. That's right. That's the other thing, that's, yes. So the government, of course, the government has been forced to cut back, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but I remember Athens, uh, uh, when they would have uh, strikes, well, they, they would have uh, uh, license plate days, odd number, even yes, number. Yes, we still have that. Oh, no, really, <laughs> only half the cars could come in yes. on a given day. Um, but uh, it was always a bustling city, but when I hear you talk, that you walk around Athens and it's quite sad, has the act basic activity completely diminished? Well, uh, the activity, no, it has not completely diminished, but uh, right now there is a website uh, we, we always look into and we check it uh, if we have to go drive down to Athens that gives mm. you a list of all the strikes that are on that <laughs> particular day or that particular week coming yeah. up and organized. That too used to exist. Right? <laughs> yeah. but it it's, was... it's not so much now a matter of strikes. I think these have been, uh, they're more or less people are, are tired of them. There's mm -hmm. no point in striking if there's there's nothing to fight for and you're not going to get anything back. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the people that have suffered the most anyway, it's from the private sector. The public yeah, sector, yeah. even today, they have not cracked down on what really has to be done with the core of the problem, which was the public sector. And is there a business, uh, we're talking about silver linings, um, I would think not only are you getting maybe these younger people who are better suppliers because they work more intelligently, more efficiently, you could also, like some wine importers, buy up vineyards. You could be buying up for very little money, some olive groves and so on, keeping them going and then taking advantage of the, 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 the depressed prices. Have you thought of doing that? No, not really, not yet. We, we have so much in our hands right here and so many projects and so many new ideas that we would love to implement that we have not thought of uh, actually going and investing in Greece. Maybe the third generation uh, <laughs> in this uh, company, my, our children will uh, do that and I would be very glad to see it. And when you go back to Amphisa, you must be like the hero, I mean, that whole, your whole family and, oh, and yes. Moskalaidis, uh, the two families must be, they must have streets named after you. There is actually oh, a street, really? <laughs> yes, actually, yes, there is a Moskalaidis street. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did recently, uh, about four years ago, uh, buy from the uh, cousins uh, the family house and renovate it. It's a beautiful house that I love to go there. It's really so nice and peaceful, and sure I, I love that uh, little town. Yeah. It's, uh, it's yeah, a joy I'm to be there. Uh, two weeks ago, before I flew back to Canada, I spent a weekend there, and I think that yeah. gave me the strength to go on. Yeah, and to keep on. <laughs> and to keep, and to keep on, keep on making this. this. So, Alexander, exactly. Efkaristo, and, and long life and good luck to you. Paracalo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander Georgiadis. And now here's something else coming up on The World Show. I think that um, what's really interesting right now, why my job is so complicated, is that um, we have to do business with clients in a lot of different ways using a lot of different technologies. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that at the same time as things are changing drastically. So one of the biggest changes lately has been uh, Collaboration and communication technologies have um, been m massively maturing and, and uh, growing. Like things like video conferencing yeah. are tools that are now available. So whereas 
folks may have uh, wanted to work directly with the teller and then moved it to ATMs, folks now may have the opportunity to work with mobile um, uh, mortgage specialists who, who bring laptops, computers, tablets mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm. on, on the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're used to coming to meet with an account manager, we're looking at right now what are some of the different ways that you can communicate with that account manager through video conferencing and other options. So we have to manage the current state the changing state and yeah. all of the different flavors until we, we see what's really going to fall out and how people are going to choose to do business with us. Alexander Georgiadis was our guest this week on Entrepreneurs, the Red Line series of The World Show, a special edition for Greece's national holiday on March 25th. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks. Mm -hmm.